Hello, everybody, and welcome to our second episode of French Rose's Workshop. My name's Richard, and I'm happy to have you here with me today. Happy New Year. All righty, we'll get started here in about five more minutes. We're going to get started. In, in the meantime, I'm just going to be right here working on some, some small things while we're getting everything set up for today's broadcast. Hi, Cynthia. Happy New Year. Happy, happy New Year. <laughs> Ooh -wee. <clears throat> And what we're doing today, this is episode two of our French Roses workshop tutorial. This is what we're working on. We're still working on blocks. <laughs> yeah, so we have four of 25 blocks complete. I'm going to do a few more of those today, and then we're going to go over that way and check out that white box and how to transfer the paper pat patterns off of the pattern. Okay, so I'm going to swap my camera so we can see what we're doing here. And it's actually about, it's not quite noon yet, so I don't want to get started too far ahead of time. But while we're waiting to get started, I'm going to get my stuff together for the, the pattern drawing. Where is that? Let's see. Where did I lay that at? I got all of my pieces cut. See here, these are all of my pieces. They're all cut for this project right here. Here's my stack of pieces. And I actually took the time to organize it and pin all the appliques for each block into a separate little stack. All that fun stuff. I thought my paper pattern was right here with this. Evidently not. And it can't be far. That is the cover sheet. Oops. Let's see here. Okay. Oh, there it is. There it is. I found it. <laughs> I was beginning to think, oh, we may have to put the pattern drafting off to the next day. I couldn't find it, but I found it. Okay. I got all that. Then, this is what I was looking for right here. I'll show you how to use a, a daylight wafer light box to transfer your patterns. And let me go grab one more thing, then we'll get started. Alright. Woohoo. 
black computer paper to do the tracing with, and I'm going to use a friction pen. I have discovered friction pens are really great, not only to mark fabric with, but just to write with also, and this kind of stuff. Perfect for it. Yay. Let me set these over here at the other station. Okay. We are ready to go now. Woohoo. Okay. Uh, that deserves a sip of coffee. <laughs> Okay. Hope everyone's having a wonderful New Year's Day. And let's all pray and hope that this year will run nice and smooth without a lot of drama. This is an election year, and I'm not going to talk politics, but I can tell you I'll be glad when this year is over <laughs> because I think it's going to be an ugly, an ugly thing across our country on this political stupidness. I'm so sick of it. So sick of it. And it hasn't really even started yet. But it is what it is what it is. So first, I'm going to grab my square of fabric for the background. And I'm just going to take the top layer oops, of my pre-sorted appliques off here. Here's the first colors we're going to do right here. Here we go. Okay, so I'm going to swap that camera and we're going to get going. Hi Karen, Happy New Year. Happy New Year Linda. Absolutely Karen. Happy New Year Donna. <laughs> okay, I just saw those messages. All right, so I'm going to swap my camera, and we're going to get started with some sewing. And yes, Karen, I agree. Sewing, sewing sanity is a good term because that's really pretty much how it works for most of us, I think. <laughs> okay, let's swap over to our close-up cam. Okay, I'm going to move this back just a bit. Oh, wonderful, Linda. Hi, Janelle. Happy New Year. Okay. So, and I'm going to officially get started now. This is what we're doing. Episode 2 of our French Roses Workshop. Soft edge applique. It's also kind of a type of reverse applique, so to speak. And we'll see what that's all about here in a moment. Let me make sure I have my little scissors. I need my tweezers. I need my tweezers. Where did those go? Where did those go? They're probably laying right here in front of me and I just can't see them. Well, we'll worry about that in a minute. <laughs> We're going to get started. And there's our background fabric. And we're going to start with our largest applique and the leaves. Okay. Just going to center this, basically, center it so it's pleasing to the eye. And then the two leaves. There we go. Now, I'm going to pin those leaves down because they get sewed down first. There's one. It's going to be more like that. There we go. And two. And keep in mind, when you're placing this fabric, you're going to have all around the outside edge, there's a quarter inch seam, so you don't want it right on that seam line. Okay. So, I'm going to lower my stitch length to 1.8. There we 
I just did that. And if you ever want them on my Bernina 475 Quilters Edition, and what I did to lower my just my stitch length, I have this little little knob right here to tur to turn, and I see it in real time right here. As I turn it, those numbers change for the stitch length. As this is stitch width, but since I'm using um, a straight stitch, that will not really come into play. I'm using foot number 37, which is a quarter inch piecing foot. And I just want to keep my stitches approximately, doesn't have to be exact, a quarter inch from the raw edge of the fabric. This technique, you do not cover up the raw edge. You want it to fray like a rag quilt. Okay. So, all I'm going to do is just stitch. I'm not going to, since the fabric will cut the Applique will come on top of this. I just I'm not going to do all all the sides just here and here on both pieces. And I'm using a gray or a fill thread in the upper thread. It's gray, and it's also in the bobbin. Same thread. I'll try to get a little better camera angle for y'all on this one. Okay. And yes, I'm using my knee lifter in case you're wondering. Hey, Bobo. Puppy's getting woke up this morning. Hey, sugar booger. What to do, Shuggy? Who's my good boy? Yes, you are. You're such a good doggy. Yes, you is. right here where my finger is. Let me get you a look at that. You can see what kind of buttons it has. There's your, <clears throat> if I was going to use it for start and stop, that's what this button is. Tie off, scissors, and reverse. On the front of the machine, this button adjusts needle up and down, end of pattern, machine speed, plus and minus, over here is where I can move the needle to the right or the left. Stitch length, stitch width. Okay. There we go. And we'll do the same thing to this side. are done. Let's cut that thread. That's the reason you're using a shorter stitch length since this is going to fray. You could even go a shorter stitch width if one wanted to say I'm at 1.8 millimeters. You could even go down to like 1.6 or 1.4 if you chose to. So now we're going to reposition our large applique. sure the raw edges of the leaves are covered up nice and neat. There we go. We'll start right there. Now we'll just go around a quarter inch on the inside of that one.
I've always found it interesting how different machines has their own, what I call, they have their own voice. The, as they're running, they have their own unique sound to them. This is a very nice voice on this machine. It's really kind of soothing. And I just really meditated. I really like so just for sewing, sewing. I don't love sewing on the screen. This little 475 Quilters Edition. And it is a special cave special edition as well. My little scissors guy. There they are. I'll trim this thread before I get to it. So I'm going to end up right back on top of the stitching where I started. There we go. Give that a cut. Now the fun part. <laughs> I have to trim off the excess fabric from in behind that applique is what I'm going to do, everyone. So, I need to take one more look for my tweezers because that sure made it a lot easier. I know they got to be, if I have to, I'll get the ones off of my searcher. Oh, here they are. We were over here at my Sasha Co machine. This is what I was looking for right here. These are Tula Pink. How funny is that? I'm sewing on a CAFE special edition machine, but I'm using Tula Pink um, tweezers. <laughs> oh gosh, that way I have the best of both worlds. So I'm going to raise this up now. You can see what I'm doing. Oh, Happy New Year, Barbara. Alrighty. All I'm going to do is grip that with the back and pull the excess fabric in the front forward to kind of create a little pocket because I'm going to snip the back side of this fabric and trim out the excess. Come on, you. There we go. Just be careful not to clip your front fabric, just the back fabric. It's a small little clip. Because then I'll put my scissors, little scissors, right in that hole and then just cut approximately a quarter inch on the inside of that stitching that I just did. I'm going to save all of these scraps I'm cutting out for a future a future quilt like this for these appliques. This is not waste. This is actually a way to create more of these appliques for something like this or maybe even a different type of applique project. Now, if you're wanting to make one of these and you don't really want the, the, the soft edge as, in the, as what you would have in a rag quilt, you could always go around and do a traditional applique with these if you wanted to. That would totally be your choice, but I'm telling you, once you see what the end result looks like, I think you would really like it because it's pretty cool looking. There, that's, that's all done. Now we're gonna do our next applique. And the only thing I wanna do, I just wanna make sure none of the edges are out over the previous line of stitching. That's the only thing I'm trying to do here. If it does, and I have no other choice, well, then it does. But I'm going to try to arrange them so that does not happen. <laughs> That's close. And yeah, I could always trim it down, but I'm not going to do that. Because, I will, you know, I, if you have followed me for long, you know I believe in serendipity, what's meant to be was meant to be. 
and that's kind of what how I feel about this project. It's a project that embodies serendipity. So here we go. We're going to do our do our stitch about a quarter inch in from the raw edge. As you can see here, there that there it is. That's what we're after because all of this is going to get nice and soft and frayed after it is longer. And you won't launder it until after it's quilted, everybody. That's when you're going to launder it. With that knee lift, it really makes it easy to stop and just move your knee over. And what that does, that lets it lay down nice and flat if it's getting bunched up a little bit. Hi, Mark. Happy New Year. Excess off the back. <coughs> Excuse me. There we go. There we go. I think once you make one of these quilt tops, you'll be an expert at doing that. <laughs> so far, I'm not an expert at doing that, so there you go. <laughs> and once again, we're just going to trim it just like we did before, about a quarter inch or so towards that, that last line of stitching. And what this does, everybody, this reduces bulk from each block. Because if we did not do this, in the very center of each block, there would be about six layers of fabric. And boy, howdy, if you've, if you, I can tell you, if you quilt a lot of quilts, like, and most of you know I'm a long armor, I quilt for people, I can tell you that trying to quilt through six layers does not make for a pretty finished product in result. It looked better if you were doing it in the hoop perhaps, but not the one a traditional long arm setup, it would not. Okay, here's that one. Now we'll do one more and then the next layer. And I'm gonna see when this was, this was a pre-cut quilt piece that I had bought about six, seven, eight years ago. I don't remember when exactly. When I was traveling for AccuQuilts when I purchased this in Georgia. But in the kit, notice how that's kind of a straight line right there. So I'm just going to curve those two corners in just so it looks a little bit better. Just want to take off those sharp little points. There we go. There we go. Now, how we get that position? There we go. Pity, pity, pity. And we'll just start over here at the edge and go all the way around in it.
I've got to figure out another way to do this little camera right here. I have it setting, it's a document camera that I have setting on my sewing table. And if I run the machine too fast, there is vibration. So I'm going to have to work on a different scenario for that. But to get it up nice and close like this, I've almost got to have it on the same table. Excess off the back. We got to do that each time. Okay. Be trim, trim, trim. Woohoo. And what I'm going to do today, I'm going to do one more block past this one, and then I'm going to show you how I use that daylight tablet to transfer, to transfer patterns whether it's something, a commercial one that you've purchased, or maybe you have something you've hand-drawn, or whatever, or coloring books, but I'm gonna show you how I use my daylight um, wafer tab, light box tablet. My wafer light box <laughs> to use for that. And I do it for more than just sewing. I use it for other things as well, drawing, I'm going to lay down guidelines for painting or something like that. They are handy little gizmos, let me tell you. There we go. Let me get that excess trimmed out. And then this block is done. That was the last applique for this particular block. Hi Kim, there's no reason to backstitch at the end of each one because I'm going over my previous line of stitching plus I have my stitch length set pretty low it's at 1.8 it could even go a little bit lower than that if we wanted to but there's no need to back stitch or tie off that stitch since I am overlapping when I come all the way around I'm going right back on top of my previous line and that basically ties off both ends. So there's no reason to do that. Great question. There we go. And 
mean, what I'm talking about, let me find one to show here on camera. Right here, I don't know if it's going to really pick it up well or not, well enough or not, but right there is where I've just went right over the top of a previous slide of stitching. There, it's coming into focus. Right here. When you come back around, you just go right over the top of where you started, and that eliminates the need to have to backstitch or anything like that. Woohoo! Okay, let's do, we're going to do another one. And then we are going to go to the light box and play with that. Okay. So once again, I'm going to roughly center that in the center of my square. Now the pattern calls for to cut these squares at nine and a half inches. I actually cut mine at 10. It's easier to cut. And maybe you'd like to do this using a layer cake for your background, which would be totally cool. But that way, it's just for me, I'd much rather cut a 10 inch square than a nine and a half. For me, it's just easier to do. Okay. And then I am going to cut my two little leaves in where they'll, where they'll be stitched down. We're going to put that underneath. In the same way in the opposite corner. Now you could put one leaf. You could put as many leaves as you wanted to on this. I'm just going by what the pattern calls for and all that fun stuff. Now that I have them under there, I'm going to pin them in place so they don't move from my positioning. There's one. Here's another one. And I'm going to stitch both of those down. Now, where that raw edge goes underneath the applique, there's no need to stitch through there because it's going to get stitch, stitched across the top of it anyway on the next set of appliques. great thing about projects like this, you could literally, you, if you have, say, maybe you have a, a Singer Featherweight that you like to sew on, this would be a great Singer Featherweight um, project as well. This only stitch that we are using is a straight stitch. Now, that being said, if a person wanted to, you could use any type of stitch in place of that straight stitch. You could do a decorative stitch, whatever your heart desired. So you're not bound just to do it the way that I'm doing it right now. I'm just going, I'm just sticking to the instructions that came with the pattern for the first one. The next one, I'm going to get a little more creative and use some decorative threads and straight stitches decorative stitches instead of just a straight stitch. But for this one, I just want to do it by the way. Because I have honestly never made one of these quilts before, and I, I find that if you're learning a new technique, sometimes it's better just to follow the, the instructions and learn it that way, and then do your own thing. Okay. Those are on there. Oh, thank you, Vanessa. Happy New Year to you as well. And Kim, Happy New Year to you. And let's see here. I'm trying to keep an eye on my, my chat window screen here. It's really here close to the machine. That way I have this new area set up. So it's a little bit better. Da, 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 da. Just wanted to look right there. There we go. That's about where it was. That works. That works for me. Now we're going to go all the way back around it.
everybody. I don't travel again until the second week of February. So I'm going to be on here a lot during the month of January, that's for sure. four stitches on top of the previous line that anchored it all down. And honestly, once this, once it's laundered and it's frayed, you're not hardly going to see those stitches I'm just doing. So, now we'll remove the excess off the back. Now you could do this this type of applique. What I'm doing right now, you could actually do that with any type of applique if you wanted to. It's especially beneficial if you're doing layer on top of layer for your applique. If I was just going to have one layer of fabric on top of this, I wouldn't be doing this. It was just a single layer of applique. That when it's more than one layer of applique. Yeah, it's, it's a good thing to trim off all that excess fabric because you can always use it in another project to think of it that way. There we go. And we'll do our next one. We'll start this one over here. down and we'll trim the excess off the back of that. Stitch and trim, stitch and trim. It's all good. Just being very careful I do not snip through my outer layer of fabric. If that were to happen, that's where you would use that darning stitch on your sewing machine to repair it with some matching thread. So if you're making one of these and that does happen, the world has not ended. You just have to be creative. 
or you could even do a cute little embroidery on top of it. It's all good. See, there's a nice piece of fabric for another applique. Get a sip of my coffee. Alrighty, let's do the next one. There's two more to go on this piece, this block. That looks pretty good to me. There we go. Let's do it right there. Excess little thread there. And then we'll trim off the excess fabric from the back. I'm just barely using the tip of my scissors to make that little first cut. Just enough so the tips of that scissors can get underneath that layer of fabric right there. There we go. And the last little applique for this block. There. I think it go. Do we really want that? Well, right there. That's going. To, we're going to call it there. Go around that. Last trim on the back side.
And I know it's not it's not a whole lot to trim, but you know I'm just going to do it because I just think it will it'll just quilt up nicer if all that extra fabric by removing all that extra fabric. <coughs> And also, if you didn't remove it, it would really make the quilt stiff after it was quilted with all that. Just think it'd be like having six layers of stabilizer <laughs> on the back of your quilt top, basically. There we go. Woohoo! All right, that gives us six completed blocks so far. All righty. One of these nights, I'm just going to sit here with the camera on and just piece all of them and knock them out. But for a detailed close up views and everything, that's what I'm doing here. So that same technique, you just have to do this, repeat this. 25 times for the small for the size of the quilt that is in the instructions. The next one I make, I'm going to make a much larger quilt that'd be more for for a bed, for a large bed. But this one I'm just making as a small throw, a throw size quilt. It would measure actually around 60 by 60 inches or something like that. Let me swap out my camera. So I'm going to move some cameras around here for the next step. Hold on just a second. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. It's really enjoyable to do. And I can tell you, once you kind of get the knack of it, it goes fairly quickly. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to move my other camera that's not on right now over to the next location and leave this one on. And... <laughs> Then I will, once I swap to that camera that I move, I will move this one so no one gets, has any motion sickness, so to speak. <laughs> I'm going to have me some of my coffee here first. Okay, so I'm going to move a camera. <clears throat> Do, do, do. We're moving a camera. Okay. Right there. Now I'm going to swap to that camera and then move my face cam. Okay. There we go. Okay, easy peasy. See, I'm right here. Ooh, there's my hand. <laughs> okay, I get seated down here. Let me grab my mouse. Come here, mouse. Let me grab my coffee. camera. Hello there. Okay. So that, and that, this is actually my computer desk I'm at now here in my classroom. So, in, directly in behind me is a rack of kimonos in various stages of 
of completion. <laughs> and what we're going to do now, though, I want to show you how awesome it is to use one, and it's they're easy to use. Not only are they awesome, but they're easy to use. And that is a, they're made by daylight, and it's called wafer. It's their little white boxes. So I'm going to swap over to my camera, and we're going to take a look at this. Okay. So here it is, right here. And I have it plugged in. I have an aught light. Now look here. Right here I have an aught light, and I have it plugged into the aught light right there. It's not on yet, believe it or not. So when I turn it on, there are rulers, and when I turn it on, it just it's not a, a tactile switch. It's all touch. Just touch it, and there's my light box on. Okay. So then, I'm going to turn it back off for a minute. So next, here is the pattern that came with. The, the, this is the pattern for the French roses. If we open it up, there's all the instructions you can see. But when we get to this side, here is a layout to cut your pieces on your fabric, the strips all that fun stuff. But here is the, the guts of our pattern right here. If you see that, you see that, it's actually one, two, three, four. There are the four flower pieces. And right here is the shape for the leaf. So all you have to do, I'm just going to lay that here on my light, my wafer. And you could take, use tape and tape it down if you wanted to. I'm just going to put it underneath the wafer um, light box just to kind of hold it in place. And if I touch it, boy howdy, you're really going to see it well. This is just printer paper. This is all it is. You could use other paper. I have actually pattern paper. It's on a big roll. But when you put that on top of that, I'm going to bring this camera over so you can see that a little bit better. But you can see, you can exactly see the lines right on top of that. Now, that being said, you could even do that with fabric and bypass doing this if you wanted to. So we'll check that out real quick. Let me grab a little piece of fabric. So right there is, look at that, I could actually draw my cutting line right onto the fabric if I wanted to, which would be a pretty cool way to do it as well. So for instance, here is, this is a friction pen, and if I wanted just to draw the applique on top of the fabric, now remember this was just a plain piece of fabric, and all I'm doing, I'm just tracing right on I'm tracing out the largest piece. Let's say I was going to cut this, use this fabric for that applique shape. You could use chalk, you could use a lead pencil, you could use even a permanent uh, Sharpie if you wanted to, but I find these friction pens are just the bomb for any type of artwork, especially for if when using it with fabric, simply because once you apply heat to it, it disappears. And you're going to be cutting right on these lines anyway, so that's going to make it even better almost back to the beginning right there. There we go. I'm going to turn my light box off and check it out. There it is. There's my applique drawn on fabric. That would be my cutting line.
purpose other. There we go. That might help right there. There you can see that though. Now I would do the same thing if I wanted to cut, if I wanted to make a paper template. Or if you were going to use template plastic, you could do the same thing. And with this, I could get the largest leaf, the largest flower shape, and one of the leaves on there. So you can mark it up as much as you need to. Happy New Year, Sarah. Linda, I'm going to be making a class announcement here in the next week. Um, some classes will start here in January, and then there won't be any more until the end of March, the last half of March when I get back from Florida. I'll have some classes scheduled for here. There could be a variety of project classes. It's not going to be a machine-based class, simply because <clears throat> Not everybody has the same machine, and I wouldn't be able to fill up the classroom. I will have room for six students per class, so it will be small, small classes. You, I encourage everybody to bring their own machine. However, if that's not possible, I have machines here that folks can use for what we'll be doing. Okay, but once again, if I just wanted to draw out, my, make my paper pattern, just like I did before, I'm going to draw out the little small piece this time. And just like I was doing it on the fabric. And remember, it does not have to be perfect. Because you can change the shape of this any way you want to. Look at this as just a suggestion. There we go. Let's do one of the leaves. Now, if you're using something like AccuQuilt, your shapes might be a little bit different size than what these on the paper are, and that's okay too. But same difference, same technique. And there we go. There are those two shapes. Let's turn that off. There's my center applique. There's one of the leaf, a leaf template. And all I'm going to do is just cut it. And I don't have paper scissors in here, so I'm not going to cut these out with my good scissors. But that's how easy it is to do. Sarah, I am going to have some virtual classes, yes. As soon as I get my classes in, March and April, my on-the-road class is over with. I'm going to be authoring some intensive searcher, searcher classes, not only here in my classroom, but also virtually as well. And those would be Zoom or StreamYard based for... Um, I'm probably going to move away from Zoom and go to StreamYard. Let me, let me go to a different camera here. There we go, okay. So, what I was talking about, I am going to be having both in-person and virtual classes. So, my virtual classes, they will not go on at the same time as an in-person class. I've thought about that and it just wouldn't be fair, in my opinion, to the people who are here in a class for me to have to divert my attention away from them and vice versa with those of you that would attend virtually. So one week will be an in-person class and the next week will be the same class but done virtually. I hope that makes sense. But I think that's the best way that I have found for that to work out. Also, I'm going to be offering private tutoring as well. I am honestly, I had it in my mind, I was just going to go when I left Baby Lock, I was going to go independent and travel wherever I wanted to, as much as I wanted to. But I can tell you, I am. this is going to be my last year of heavy traveling. And as I integrate my 
in-person classroom and my virtual classroom together. I'm also going to be offering private tutoring that would not have to be in person. That could also be virtual on a machine of your choice. So let's say you have an Altair or a Solaris or Bernine, whatever you have, I will offer private tutoring as long as I have that machine. <laughs> if I don't have that machine, I can still train you on how to use it. But if I don't have the machine, that would be one you would have to attend in person. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Now, another cool thing about the Daylight Wafer Box, and I've never I bought it when I bought this, but I never did have used it yet. It comes with an overlay for it that's actually a, a self-healing cutting mat. So you'd actually put your pattern underneath the cutting mat and then put your fabric on top of the cutting mat and use a rotary cutter to cut them off without ever cutting a paper pattern. That's kind of cool. I thought that would be kind of cool as well. This is the middle sized um, wafer daylight box. There's a smaller one and then a larger one. This is the mid sized one. It's I think 11 by 17. Ooh, okay. That was a mouthful. <laughs> and just to, a quick, to show you what I'm working on over at the Sashiko, and I'm going to be doing some, some live Sashiko streaming this coming week. I have just, I've got more that I'm going to get scheduled. So what I'm making here, right here, this is an OB belt for kimonos and for um, yakata just kimono type robes let's just leave it kimono is is such so many things fall under that category of kimono which we'll be exploring fully but yeah i'm going to be having it's going to be part of my my sasha will be used along with my serger and my sewing machine i'll use all my machines for my different types of um Japanese garment and apparel making. Okay, I was like, I had this knotted. I'm not gonna, I'm going to actually hand stitch down my opening. So here it is, right here. I've turned, <clears throat> show so you can see some of my stitching here. Okay, this, the curvy stitch on there. There we go. There we go. Now you can see it. That curvy stitch, that's a serpentine stitch on the sewing machine. Okay. And then, of course, I hand sewed all of this. Isn't my hand sewing perfect? <laughs> no. This is on the Sasha Co machine, everybody. <laughs> my hand sewing does not come out perfect like that. But is, I thought this really turned out nice. I really like how it looked. This has a little bit of stiffness to it, which is something that you want with a type of, with a kimono. I might just call it an obi. It's one type of an obi belt is what it is. But it's really long. Okay, so it's probably about hmm, 200 centimeters or a little better than that. I just need that extra length to wrap it around your waist once you get your robe or slash kimono on. But what I've done, and then I joined, it was about, I cut this at 12 inches. This is about a 12 inch width of fabric. I put it on top of no-show mesh stabilizer, flat, and then I did my decorative stitching. Just like I was quilting, basically. Instead of batting, I used no-show mesh. Then I made a tube out of it, turned it wrong side out. You can see my seam, my seam right there, and I pressed it nice and flat after it was stitched. And then that leaves me with about a six inch wide OB belt. It has beautiful texture to it. The thread, Believe it or not, it's a variegated thread, and it is, I used a couple of different types of thread. 
go over here to my Sasha code and pull that off. So the variegated is this right here. This is Madeira Katona variegated. That's a 50 weight thread. Right? Right? No, that's a 30 weight thread. I'm sorry. That's a 30 weight thread. Okay. And that was the Sashiko stitching. Then for the, the serpentine stitch, that was... Hold on now. I used two different types of thread. I used this here for some of the, the streaks of the serpentine, where you see that variegated on the serpentine. But then, like right... Let me get closer here. Okay. Right over here is where I'm wanting. Right here. Okay. Right here, you can see how that serpentine, it has that, my fingers, right there, that is variegated. But then, right there where my finger's at, that one is not variegated. That is this. This is accent by Wonderfill, and it's a 12 weight rayon thread right here. And a beautiful plum color. It really goes well with the fabric. The fabric is actually um, Andover, it's a purple chambray cotton fabric that I am going to also make a fitted kimono, and this is going to be the belt for it. Okay, out of that fabric, yes. <laughs> Ooh, a lot of fun. <laughs> and then I could also have done some decorative stitching with the serger, but I just felt that was enough for this one because I, I think I just think it looks really nice. When you pull it away, you can see. Look at all the texture. That's what that serpentine stitch did. It added texture to it. Because I elongated that serpentine, I didn't. It was just two millimeters on the length, but I widened it, and that way, the wider that serpentine is, the more texture it will add to a piece of fabric. But when I hit let that light hit it, you can certainly see the beautiful texture in it. Okay. But anyway, what I'm going to do here, I'm actually going to hand sew whip stitch the two ends where I have them turned I have them turned in and I'm just gonna hand sew that that closed. And now now that I said that where did I put my needle and thread at? Because I already had the needle thread. There it is, I see it. Woohoo. There we go. <laughs> you can see my needle is threaded right there. There it is. <laughs> okay. I'm going to set this back to the Sashiko table. <laughs> Woohoo. Oh, thank you, Kim. Oh, my goodness. So much fun, everybody. Okay. Definitely coffee time. And I've got to go in there and get dinner started here. We. We are having, let's see, I'm making, we're making beans and ham in the Instapot. Oh, thank you, Donna. I tell you, I've sold, I've made, I've made seven kimonos for customers for this holiday season. And I would have got everything done that I wanted to get done before Christmas. But Mike and I both got sick at the same time. And we were down for a couple more than almost two and a half weeks. And boy, howdy. 
I'm so glad that part is over with, but it really put me behind on my sewing and I've got to really dig in and get busy with it and get, get caught up again. Gosh, this is January. Doesn't, where did 2023 go, everybody? It, it went by so quickly, my goodness. And hopefully this year, not wishing the time to go by fast, but I just want all the drama of the next 12 months to be over with because I'm sure a lot of you are like me. I'm burned out with the political atmosphere in our country. It's ridiculous. And I'm not talking about one side or the other here. I'm talking about both sides over it all, completely over it. But anyway, that's all I'll say on that matter. Anyway, so I'm going to spend the next 12 months sewing my little fingers to the bone. <laughs> also, yay, which me kind of semi, I'm just kind of semi-retired, I guess would be the way to say it. But I'm also going to start spinning yarn again. I haven't spun at my spinning wheel in over two years. And I just can't wait to get started with that again. I've missed spinning my yarns and stuff and weaving. <sighs> okay. All of that being said, I want to thank each and every one of you for turning, tuning in today. <laughs> Woohoo! Oh, what I was saying earlier, though, I am getting ready to swap from Zoom to something called StreamYard, simply because I have to pay for that. That comes out of my pocket. I think my Zoom account's about $160 or so a year. But, and StreamYard is about the same price, but it offers um, a lot a lot more flexibility on things that I would like to do. For instance, I think with StreamYard, I could actually pull off streaming not only to YouTube, but possibly even to Facebook at the same time. I did it, I managed to do it a couple of times but my, my computers were not strong enough to handle that type of bandwidth requirements on my end, so to speak. But with StreamYard, I just have to stream one stream into StreamYard, and then it will branch it out to the other places I want it to go. So that's something I'm working on for this is my big goal for 2024, is to be able to stream my lives across multiple platforms at the same time. Fingers crossed. <laughs> but, and I think I have a, uh, I have it in my head, an issue, the way I'm going to solve that camera vibration whew, when I'm over there sewing with, see this little camera here is what I use for close-ups. Okay, this is a document camera. If you've been to one of my classes out on the road, you've seen me bring this with me. But if you have it setting on the table that your machine is on, the, it vibrates a little bit. So I'm going to have to put a camera on a tripod so it's not on the table to make that work. And that's what I'm going to start playing with this next week. This week. <laughs> This does not seem like Monday to me. This seems like Sunday for some reason. My days are all messed up. Oh, Tracy, you're going to see me spin. I love to spin. I have um, three spinning wheels right now, an electric one and then two different. I have a, two different pedal machines. One is from one of my spinning, first spinning wheels from Boulder. Uh, it's a shock ladybug. And then I have a spin illusion. Monarch also. It's a big quill. They don't love to spin yarn. My gosh, you want to talk about something relaxing and it will give you, it's almost like using a treadle sewing machine. So it does give you a little bit of exercise in your legs as you're sitting there doing that. But it's a lot of fun. Okay. Whew, that was a mouthful. 
So everybody, I'm going to call it. I'm going to go in and start working on our New Year's Day dinner, ham and beans, and I'm actually also going to fry some chicken in the deep fryer. <laughs> but yay. I will get some more um, things scheduled tonight. And there's going to be a lot of these that start at noon because after being home, the amount of time I've been, I can tell you six o'clock forward at night is kind of difficult for me. <laughs> I get, I'm used to going to bed. I get really tired at night. That's part of aging, I guess, but whatever. A lot of these classes, Friday night will always be at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for Feature Friday. However, the other classes are pretty much going to be starting at noon simply because it's easier on me to do that. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I will see you all tomorrow. It'll be at noon. I'm going to work on, probably going to do Sasha Coat. Yeah, we're going to work on some Sasha Coat stuff tomorrow at noon and all that fun stuff. It'll just, yeah, 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 yeah. But in the meantime, I'm going to be working on those blocks so we can get those done. But anyway, I'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you, Janelle. Thank you, Donna. Everyone have a great day. Happy New Year. Gross Noya. And oh, Michael's already working on dinner. <laughs> thank you, Mikey. <laughs> but... See you soon, Kim. Everybody, Kim is, is one of my wonderful ladies that live here close, and she comes in the shop quite often. She's such a nice lady. Looking forward to seeing you again, Kim, real soon. Okay, everyone, have a wonderful, happy New Year's Day, and I'm still going to be sewing later, but gonna, gonna go get, we're going to go work on dinner. Thank you, everyone. Bye. I'll see you all tomorrow.